Hello, thank you for joining today's NCCN webinar for patients squamous cell skin cancer. My name is Tanya Fisher. NCCN stands for National Comprehensive Cancer Network. NCCN is a not-for-profit alliance of 33 leading cancer centers across the United States devoted to patient care, research, and education. NCCN Foundation is a nonprofit organization that raises funds for the NCCN patient resources, including new and updated patient guidelines, as well as patient webinars. These are funded using financial support from generous donors. The NCCN guidelines for patients are based on the NCCN clinical practice guidelines used by healthcare providers worldwide. They explain the same options for cancer care, but are written for patients and their caregivers, family, and friends. You can view and download free copies of the guidelines from patients from the NCCN website. High quality printed copies of the book can be purchased through Amazon. The NCCN webinars for patients complement the NCCN guidelines for patients. They cover a series of topics discussed by expert presenters. Viewers have an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the presentation. This brings us to the presenters for today's webinar. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Sue Park. Dr. Park is a medical oncologist and associate professor of medicine at University of California, San Diego Health. Moore's Cancer Center. Following Dr. Park, we will hear from Christine Kim. Christine is an oncology nurse practitioner with the University of California, San Francisco, Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Network. Sorry, Cancer Center. And our third presenter today is Samantha Gill, or Sam, patient advocate and president of the Skin Cancer Education Research Foundation. Now I will turn it over to Dr. Park. Thanks everyone. Um, thank you all for joining today. I would really like to thank NCCN for the opportunity to talk about squamous cell skin cancer. And I'm really delighted to be joined by two wonderful colleagues. So we'll talk about, um, we'll begin by starting to talk about how squamous cell carcinoma starts. So what is squamous cell carcinoma or squamous cell skin cancer? So squamous cell skin cancer is a non-melanoma skin cancer. And non-melanoma skin cancer refers to all the types of cancers that occur in the skin that are not melanoma. So these include squamous cell skin cancer and basal cell skin cancer or basal cell carcinoma. Uh, these are the two main types of non-melanoma skin cancers. There are other types, but those are more rare. Uh, squamous cell skin cancer develops from the flattened squamous cells that you can see in the picture. Um, in the upper part of the skin layer, the epidermis, and those cells are shown in the light purple color. And you can also see the basal cell layer, which is in darker purple. And this is where basal cell skin cancer comes from. Uh, we also have melanocytes, um, and these are cells that contain pigment, and they reside in the basal layer, and they give color to our skin, our eyes, our hair, and that is where melanoma begins. So squamous cell skin cancer is a second most common form of skin cancer, and it accounts for about 20% of all skin cancers um, within the non-melanoma skin cancer um, paradigm. Uh, since squamous cell skin cancer is a UV light-driven cancer, it is much more common in white populations, and that's because their skin is more sensitive to sunlight. Um, but I do want to stress that Skin cancer is colorblind. You know, anyone can get skin cancer. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. And so it's a common misnomer that if you have darker skin that you are uh, protected from skin cancer, that's not true. Uh, the incidence of squamous cell skin cancer is increasing. And this is probably due to a combination of factors, such as, you know, for improving skin cancer detection rates, more sun exposure, people are living longer. The incidence of squamous cell skin cancer is also higher in men, and this is thought to be due to more sun exposure in males. And squamous cell skin cancer is also more common in older people, and that's probably due to more sun exposure over time and more sun damage over time. 
but these cancers are actually also becoming more common in younger people. And this is what we think is probably related to more sun exposure. So exposure to ultraviolet radiation or UV radiation from natural or artificial sunlight is the main risk factor for squamous cell skin cancer. So where you live really affects your risk. You know, the closer you are to the equator, and that's where the sun rays are the strongest, the higher the incidence of squamous cell skin cancer that we see. And this is also why people who are fair skinned or have light colored skin, you know, are at higher risk for developing squamous cell skin cancer. There are other established risk factors um, for developing a squamous cell skin cancer, and this also includes having a weakened immune system, whether it's because you have a certain disease or you're on certain medications. Um, chronic inflammation is also um, a risk factor for this type of cancer. There are certain inherited conditions that can increase your risk of getting these types of skin cancers. And there are certain drugs that actually sensitize your skin to UV light, making you more prone to get a squamous cell skin cancer. So as a UV light driven tumor, uh, squamous cell skin cancer has a UV molecular signature and it has a lot of mutations. So when tumors have a lot of mutations, they generate a lot of novel foreign substances that you can see in this um, diagram. Uh, and these foreign substances are called neoantigens. And these neoantigens actually enhance recognition um, of the tumor cell by cancer fighting T cells. And this makes the cancer cell, in this case, a squamous cell skin cancer cell, to be more likely to respond to certain treatments like immunotherapy, and that's something that we'll discuss later. Um, there are several key genes that are involved in the development of a squamous cell skin cancer, and these include genes like TP53, NOTCH12, CDKN2A, FAT1, KMTC2C, KMT2C, and KMT2D. And why do I list these uh, you know, genes? Why are they important? Well, uh, there's lots of consensus now among many guideline um, committees that, you know, suggest patients with a, um, you know, advanced cancer, and sometimes that can include squamous cell skin cancer, should get molecular profiling. So on all of my patients, I typically order molecular profiling, which gives me more information about their tumor and can give me sometimes more information on how I can treat them. And in this patient, you can see that this patient of mine with a squamous cell skin cancer has a lot of those mutations that we just talked about, such as CDKN2A, FAT1, TP53, and at the bottom, you can also see the KMT2C and 2D genes. So now let's talk about what squamous cell skin cancer looks like clinically. So squamous cell skin cancers usually develop on areas, you know, exposed to the sun because that's what drives them and they can have varying appearances. Uh, many of the lesions are actually symptomatic. A lot of patients come to me and they only have noticed a new bump or skin lesion, um, but they don't really tell me that they have pain. Um, sometimes these lesions can be painful and sometimes they can be associated with neurologic symptoms such as numbness or tingling or even paralysis of one side of the face. And if you have any of those symptoms, it means the cancer is probably really serious. And it might also be a sign of something called perineural invasion. And that's when the cancer has actually invaded the space around a nerve. One thing to really you know, think about when you check your skin is that if a new spot does not go away on its own, to please go and have it checked out by your doctor because you never know what it could be. So while dermatologists, you know, they're often able to take a look at your skin and really make a diagnosis during their exam, but you really need a skin biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. You know, a skin biopsy will not only confirm the diagnosis, but also provides us with a lot of pathologic information that can tell us more about, you know, your risk for the cancer coming back. Is your skin cancer a high risk or low risk cancer? And, um, you know, sometimes we will do imaging on a lot of patients with squamous cell skin cancer, but it's not something that is routinely done. But I think it's something that should be considered for patients that have 
a large tumor or really concerning symptoms or really concerning findings on a physical exam, or if I know that their tumor has high risk features, because this increases the risk that the cancer is already extending further than what we see. So the purpose of imaging here is to really define the extent of disease. So there are two main staging systems for squamous cell skin cancer. Uh, and staging is just a term that we use in oncology to determine how much cancer is in the body and where is it located. So the AJCC, or the American Joint Committee on Cancer, the eighth edition, this is a commonly used staging system, but this staging system is limited to squamous cell skin cancer of the head and neck only. Uh, there's another staging system called the BWH system or the Brigham and Women's Hospital staging system. And this system really focuses on the high risk factors of the primary tumor. And so for AJCC, a T3 or T4 tumor is considered to be a high risk one. Whereas for Brigham and Women's staging, a T2B or a T3 is considered high risk. Here you can see um, why we define these high risk groups, you know, so um, you can see that the high risk groups for both the AJCC staging system and the Brigham and Women's Hospital staging system, they have poor outcomes and you can see that in these graphs um, where poor outcomes have been defined by the high cumulative incidence of either, you know, local recurrence, meaning that the disease has come back in the area it was previously or the disease has um, gone to spread to lymph nodes in the nearby area. You can also see that the Brigham and Women's staging system is a bit more distinct than the AJCC one, because if you remember from the last slide, AJCC T2 is not considered high risk, only T3 and T4. But if you look at the AJCC graphs on top, you can see that T3 and T2 has significant overlap, whereas there's no overlap between T2B and T3 for the Brigham and Women's Hospital. So this is taken from the NCCN uh, guidelines uh, um, uh, template, and you can see that um, here we list the features that are associated with the high likelihood for recurrence or for the cancer coming back, um, which include, you know, um, any cancer that is in the head and neck, that's considered high risk. Any cancer that has come back, that's also considered high risk. You know, tumors that are deeply invasive, having perineural invasion, those are also considered high risk. Rapidly growing tumors, um, having any neurologic symptoms that may suggest that you have perineural invasion, tumors coming from patients that are immune suppressed, or coming from areas where there's, you know, a history of prior radiation or chronic inflammation are also in this high risk category. And having tumors that have a poor differentiation when you look at them under the microscope or certain histologic subtypes are also associated with worse outcomes. So the sentinel lymph nodes, um, you can have more than one, um, are the first lymph nodes that receive direct lymphatic drainage from the site of the skin cancer. Um, and these are the areas that are most likely to have microscopic disease from the skin cancer. So sentinel lymph node biopsy is a technique that's routinely used in the melanoma skin cancer and is used in that context to determine the likelihood that one of these sentinel lymph nodes um, has occult disease without taking all of the lymph nodes out. But for squamous cell skin cancer, this procedure, it may provide some prognostic information, but it has not really been shown to help patients live longer. Um, and so because the data for sentinel lymph node biopsy is actually quite limited, uh, and there's a lot of conflicting data, um, this procedure is something that should be discussed in a multidisciplinary setting with your physicians. So now that we have reviewed how squamous cell skin cancer develops in the risk factors um, and what it looks like clinically and the features associated with uh, poor outcomes, how do we treat this? So I want to start off by saying that, you know, if there is a clinical trial near you or one that is available to you, you know, whether it's a surgery clinical trial, 
a radiation clinical trial or an oncology clinical trial. You know, we really always try to encourage patients to ask for more information about clinical trials in general, because clinical trials really represent the forefront of medical research, and they really help us find ways to help patients live longer, improve their quality of life, and really manage or cure their disease. So all the standard treatments that we have right now today were once part of a clinical trial. <clears throat> so surgery is the first line treatment for local squamous cell skin cancer, whether it is low risk or high risk. But for low risk squamous cell skin cancer, we usually consider standard surgery and we do about a margin of four to six millimeters. That's the current recommendation. So this technique is what most of us commonly think of when we say surgery, we just cut it out. You know, the surgery specimen is cut into vertical sections, as you can see here. And this uh, technique is also known as bread loafing because it's like slicing a loaf of bread. Um, and then you review under the microscope to make sure that the margins or the edges um, are free from tumor. Um, but in the figure two, you can see that a portion of the tumor was missed, but you wouldn't be able to tell when looking at the microscope slides several days after the surgery was done. And that is why there is this recommendation to have a four to six millimeter margin. But um, fortunately for us, you know, for low risk squamous cell skin cancer, the recurrence rate is only around 5% or so with this technique. So um, it's pretty good to just cut it out with uh, four to six millimeter margins. Most patients do very well. But for uh, squamous cell skin cancer, that's considered high risk. Um, we typically recommend a special type of surgery called Mohs micrographic surgery, or most commonly just known as Mohs surgery. And this is a special technique that utilizes, you know, sequential horizontal sections that are taken during the surgery, and then immediately looking at them under the microscope to look at the edges. Um, with this technique, you remove thin layers of tissue around the skin cancer, both, you know, at the bottom and the side. And this makes it possible to look at 100% of the margin to really make sure that you don't have any tumor left at the edges during the surgery. And so this process is repeated, keep taking the horizontal layers off until you have no tumor left that you can see, as you can um, see in figure five. So with this technique, you would have caught that portion of tumor that was missed um, in figure two, and you would have been able to go back and take another layer of tissue until you got clear margins. So for patients who have low risk squamous cell skin cancer and are not surgical candidates or they refuse surgery, we can also consider uh, local destructive techniques by your dermatologist like curatage and electrodesiccation or sometimes cryotherapy. We can also consider radiation, um, but we would only consider this for select patients and we often only offer this to the older patient population. And then for patients with high risk squamous cell skin cancer, where you know they are also not candidates for surgery or, or refuse surgery, you know our two main options are either systemic therapy, which we will discuss, or radiation. And again, radiation here is often reserved for older patients. So there are two main ways we use radiation for treatment. So we can use radiation as primary treatment, so primary radiation for patients who are not surgery candidates. Uh, the drawback with this is that with primary radiation, you're not really able to assess the tumor margin. So you don't really know that you know everything is clear. You're just giving a beam of radiation to what you can see. But uh, the radiation oncologists are really good nowadays, and they'll you know plan out their beam mapping to make sure they cover what they feel like is a generous field. Um, the other way we use radiation is in the adjuvant setting. Adjuvant meaning after surgery. So some patients may end up having a positive margin even after surgery. And if those patients cannot get more surgery to clear that positive margin, sometimes we will consider giving radiation after the surgery to treat that remaining cancer. And in some other cases where actually the margins are negative after surgery, um, if the tumor is high risk or has certain poor prognostic features, for example, um, extensive perineural invasion, um, we will often discuss giving adjuvant radiation or radiation after the surgery, even though the margins were negative, to decrease the risk of the cancer coming back in the future. 
So there are some situations where we may consider adding chemotherapy to the radiation that you are getting after surgery. And this is not routinely done, but um, sometimes we do it because the chemotherapy helps the radiation work better. And this may lead to a longer time that you are disease free, um, but it may not help you live longer. So there was a big phase three trial, the TROG trial, and it looked at adding the chemotherapy drug carboplatin to radiation after surgery, but the study was negative. There was no benefit with the addition of chemotherapy. Um, but we know that adding chemotherapy um, using the drug cisplatin, um, when we combine it with radiation after surgery for patients with mucosal head and neck squamous cell skin cancer, I mean, it's squamous cell carcinoma. So this is um, squamous cell carcinoma, not of the skin, but of areas in the head and neck, like the mouth or the tongue or the throat. Um, we know that they benefit when we add chemotherapy to radiation. So we extrapolate those data and try to apply it to patients with uh, squamous cell skin cancer, but there has never been um, a big trial telling us that it actually helps patients live longer. So we only consider this in select situations. So there, there are some cases where, you know, um, surgery is not an option, radiation is not an option, um, and those are the, you know, treatments that we would be, per, you know, be best preferred for patients with a high-risk squamous cell skin cancer. Um, but for those cases where not, nothing is an option, and then we will discuss, you know, systemic therapy, which actually consists of typically IV infusions or sometimes pills. And there are three broad classes of systemic therapy. So we have immunotherapy, with programmed cell death one inhibitors, or more commonly known as PD one inhibitors, um, and there are two FDA approved agents, simiplumab and pembrolizumab. Um, we also have chemotherapy. Uh, we most commonly use carboplatin with paclitaxel, and we also have targeted therapy. And the one that we most commonly use is called cetuximab. Uh, so the um, advent of immunotherapy, you know, has really revolutionized how we treat squamous cell skin cancer, especially for patients with advanced disease, um, which we often define, you know, as disease that we cannot manage with surgery or radiation. And so it's really important nowadays to have a multidisciplinary tumor board discussion. Um, if you're a patient that has advanced squamous cell skin cancer, um, you know, with clinical trials that we have now, new therapy is always coming out on the horizon. You know, defined areas of clinical expertise and really different ways to sequence the therapies. It's really helpful to have different specialists work together to help deliver complex care to you. So, I want to spend um, a little bit of time talking about systemic therapy with a focus on immunotherapy. So, checkpoint proteins help keep immune responses in check. Um, PD1 is a checkpoint protein and it's on T cells. And you can see here the T cells in blue, the cancer cells in pink. So PD-1 is a checkpoint protein on T cells, and it acts as an off switch, and it helps prevent attacks on other cells in the body. But some cancer cells, including squamous cell skin cancer, you know, sometimes they have lots of the PD-L1 checkpoint protein, and this actually helps them escape the cancer-fighting T cell. There are two PD-1 inhibitors that are FDA approved, as I mentioned, um, that are listed here. So these drugs are given intravenously and they work by blocking this interaction between the PD-1 checkpoint protein on the cancer-fighting T cell and blocking that interaction with the PD-L1 checkpoint protein on the cancer cell. And when you block this interaction, this restores the cancer-fighting activity of the T cell. So in 2018, you know, simiplumab was the first PD-1 uh, inhibitor that was FDA approved for advanced squamous cell skin cancer. And, you know, whenever I use these drugs in clinical practice in the real world setting, you know, I typically see response rates of up to 50 to 60%. And here you can see dramatic tumor responses with uh, the PD-1 inhibitor treatment alone. So these patients um, were in the uh, trial where um, simiplumab, simiplumab was looked at for this cancer in the very first uh, place, and these patients got no surgery and no radiation. So with favorable tumor responses, you know, to PD-1 inhibition or PD-1 blockade, you know, we now have to ask ourselves several questions. You know, how long do we treat patients for with this drug? You know, especially what if all their cancer goes away? 
you know, how long will the cancer stay away while on the treatment? And then can the cancer still be under control and stay away if we stop treatment? You know, are there, are there any tests that can really tell us if a patient will have a good response and how long that response will last? So here you can see that um, about uh, the progression free survival is about um, 30 to 40%. Um, so up to the two year mark, a lot of these, you know, a considerable portion of these patients have disease control even far out as two years. And so in the real world clinical setting, you know, we do see patients who can stop treatment for um, advanced squamous cell skin cancer, um, especially if they've been getting treatment for a while and all their cancer has either gone away or responded really well. And we can see that when we stop treatment for these patients, that their responses are durable, meaning that the disease remains under control of treatment. And there's a lot of research focused on this. Uh, the, so there are special considerations that we must think about with certain squamous cell skin cancer populations. Um, yeah, and so solid organ transplant is one that I want to particularly highlight. You know, having a solid organ transplant is a contraindication to immunotherapy with these PD-1 blockers, and that's because there's an increased risk for organ rejection. For kidney transplant patients, however, you know, if you're willing to consider going back on dialysis as a backup, then immunotherapy may be an option for you, but only after a careful discussion with your physician. Uh, for solid organ transplant recipients, it's really important to try to reduce your immune suppression um, to the lowest doses that are needed to maintain your graft and to really follow with dermatology very closely and to make sure that you're um, practicing sun safe practices. Uh, when considering immunotherapy in a patient who received an allogeneic stem cell transplant, so this is often used for patients that have a blood cancer, um, the risk of getting graft versus host disease must be discussed. And then for patients with pre-existing autoimmune disease, um, there are multiple, multiple factors we need to consider um, because the immunotherapy could either exacerbate the underlying autoimmune disease or actually put them at higher risk for developing certain immune related adverse events that you will hear more about from Christine Kim. So in all these situations, it's really important to have a multidisciplinary conversation. So going back to the standard treatment of surgery, there are three, three, there are three things we need to consider when considering surgery. So how will surgery affect the patient's appearance? You know, our appearance is closely associated with quality of life. How will surgery affect the patient's function, such as, you know, your vision or your ability to talk or chew or swallow? You know, if, for example, you have a squamous cell skin cancer that's maybe close to your eye or it's close to your lip, you know, will surgery also be able to get rid of the tumor completely? Or even with extensive surgery, there's a high likelihood that you'll still have tumor left over and that the margin will be positive. So with favorable tumor responses to PD-1 blockade, like we just saw, you know, the question now is, can we incorporate these, you know, PD-1 inhibitors into this surgical workflow for squamous cell skin cancer? And here you can see two patients with um, pretty large locally advanced squamous cell skin cancer on their um, head and neck. Um, and these patients had marked tumor regression after getting treatment with PD-1 inhibitors before surgery. And this actually allowed them to get less extensive surgery and so neither of these patients lost their right eye, um, it, but if they had not gotten the, the immune therapy before surgery and only went to surgery um, right away, they most likely would have had to have their right eye um, taken out. So this is called neoadjuvant therapy. So neoadjuvant PD-1 blockade with semiflamab. So neoadjuvant meaning before surgery. Um, it was studied in a phase two trial and published last year. So most of these patients in this trial received four doses of semiflamab before surgery. And most of the patients in this trial had squamous cell skin cancer of the head and neck. And most patients had stage three or four disease. And keeping in mind that, you know, stage four for squamous cell skin cancer does not necessarily mean that you have disease that is far away or distant. Um, for head and neck cancer, stage four can just mean that it's locally advanced. So the primary endpoint of this trial was something called pathologic complete response, meaning that when they looked at the surgery specimen under the microscope, there was no residual tumor cells that they could see. So, you know, 51% of the patients in this trial had a path CR where when you looked at their surgery specimen, there was no tumor left. 
an, addi an additional 10% of patients had a major pathologic response, meaning that there was 10% or less tumor cells um, in the surgical specimen when you looked at it under the microscope. And what was interesting is that what you saw on the imaging on a CT scan or an MRI, it did not really readily translate to what you would see under the microscope. So we had about 51 patients that had no tumor after getting this treatment when we looked at it under the microscope, but there was only 6% of patients who had a complete response um, on a CT scanner or MRI, meaning that we couldn't see any more disease on the imaging. And so that brings me to my last slide. You know, you might be asking yourself, you know, why not give these PD-1, you know, inhibitors after surgery in the adjuvant setting rather than before surgery? And that's a question, that's a great question. And there are several ongoing phase three trials right now um, where they're looking at giving PD-1 blockade after surgery in the adjuvant setting, and hopefully they will give us some answers. Um, and do we still need to consider giving radiation after surgery if there's no tumor that we can see in the surgical specimen for those patients that got, you know, the PD-1 blockers before surgery. And we actually have some data that suggests that, you know, adjuvant radiation or radiation after surgery, it might, you, you might be able to avoid it in the patients who have no tumor left in their surgery specimen. And then how can we pick which patients should or should not get, you know, neoadjuvant therapy or this therapy before surgery? So the treatment landscape for squamous cell skin cancer is constantly evolving um, and patients with high risk and advanced disease would really benefit from multidisciplinary consultation. Uh, so thank you so much for your time and then I'll um, turn it over to Christine Kim. Thanks Dr. Park. Um, as mentioned earlier, my name is Christine Kim and I'm a oncology nurse practitioner at UCSF. Um, today we'll be discussing uh, uh, side effects um, that patients who are those who are undergoing treatment for squamous cell skin cancer. Um, so, um, as Dr. Park has mentioned in her talk, um, there are uh, different treatments to treat squamous cell skin cancer, uh, including surgery radiation, chemotherapy, and immune checkpoint inhibitors, or ICIs. Um, the, so immune checkpoint inhibitors, um, or anti-PD-1, um, are now recommended as first-line uh, treatment for those uh, with advanced squamous cell skin cancer who are not eligible for surgery or radiotherapy based on results of phase two clinical trials. Um, but with the addition of um, these immune checkpoint inhibitors to treat um, squamous cell skin cancers, uh, there are also side effects uh, that could develop from using these agents. Um, and so for the purpose of this um, webinar, we'll be discussing just uh, side effects related to immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, so some um, general points about uh, side effects with uh, ICIs. Uh, so, side effects may happen at any time during treatment or sometimes even after stopping immunotherapy. Um, but on average, uh, side effects occur within three months of start of treatment. Um, these side effects are different for everyone uh, and they're based on, um, you know, your, your general health, uh, comorbidities that you might have, the type of um, immune checkpoint inhibitors you receive. Um, so uh, that it's, it can be all different. Um, on uh, early, uh, early grading, um, following a suspected immune-related uh, adverse event is necessary um, so that proper treatment can be given. Um, and usually, sometimes we use multidisciplinary specialists um, uh, for some of these side effects. Um, we usually follow a, a grading system um, to, to determine what kind of treatment we would need to give uh, for adverse events. Um, so if you uh, see the slide here, um, grade one, uh, you can usually continue immunotherapy with close monitoring and supportive care. Um, grade two, uh, you know, immunotherapy may need to be held until um, symptoms decrease to grade one. And at, at, during this time, sometimes corticosteroids can be administered. Um, for grade three, uh, we usually hold immunotherapy um, and administer high-dose corticosteroids. 
uh, and and sometimes we can restart, but there's caution um, on restarting. So it might take um, you know just close monitoring uh, if they do restart. Uh, for grade four, usually this means um, permanently discontinuing immunotherapy, um, with the exception of endocrinopathy and endocrinopathies controlled with hormone replacement. Um, so, corticosteroids are usually recommended for first line um, approach to management of um, the side effects graded two and above. Um, in general, we want to use the lowest effective corticosteroid prescribed for the shortest possible duration. Um, and uh, if the corticosteroids do not work um, or an additional medication is needed, uh, we can sometimes use um, steroid sparing agents um, the, uh, like infliximab or um, Salcept. Uh, so the because the immune related adverse events can be slow to resolve, um, patients should have regular follow up and frequent interval assessment um, of whether uh, the treatment is working for their really side, really side effect um, and and a special point is that sometimes patients don't know that, uh, you know, discontinuing corticosteroids um, suddenly can cause um, adverse events as well. So they should be advised that, uh, to consult their medical team if, um, you know, even discontinuing corticosteroids. Um, as this uh, slide indicates, uh, side effects can pretty much occur in any part of the body. Um, uh, if the body is not um, able to reverse some of the inflammation that the immune checkpoint inhibitors cause, um, then the and, and then side effect can happen um, to that part of the body. Um, so in the next few slides, we will be talking about um, some of these side effects in detail. So one of the most common reported side effect of um, immune checkpoint inhibitors is skin toxicities. Um, they usually represent about 50% of all observed cases, um, and they tend to occur within weeks after starting treatment. Um, so the skin toxicities can be, uh, you know, as 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 uh, severe as um, you know, like bolus pemphigoid or Steven Johnson syndrome, or it could be just as mild as just a regular rash. Um, so we uh, we base it on grade and determine whether patients can um, continue treatment or not. So for grade one cases, the immune checkpoint inhibitors can mostly li most likely be continued. Uh, for grade two cases, um, you may need to temporarily interrupt um, immune checkpoint therapy, but it it really depends on how how uh, how much the patient can tolerate. Um, and then grade three cases, uh, you know, usually will require um, sometimes cortical steroids or topical steroids. And for grade four cases, um, like the bolus pemphigoid or Steven Johnson syndrome, hospital admission is usually required. Um, and uh, when we usually refer to dermatology for management, and if we suspect something a little bit more severe uh, uh, for a biopsy. Um, so, so another common, another side effect that could develop are, is um, lung toxicity, and um, so immune-related interstitial lung disease or pneumonitis has an incidence of less than um, five percent uh, for all receiving um, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, but can can be uh, life-threatening. Um, you know, presentation can be with or without symptoms. Um, sometimes we see uh, some of these um, pneumonitis uh, on imaging when we're, you know, getting scans for, uh, you know, assessment of their response. Um, so, but patients can also have some symptoms like uh, di difficulty breathing, um, cough, chest pain, fever, um, and often uh, worse on exertion. Uh, if they do have dyspnea and cough, you should uh, trigger comprehensive workup in patients uh, receiving the immune checkpoint inhibitors. So this includes um, uh, uh, this includes uh, CT scans, pulse ox, um, you know, screening for uh, any sort of infection, um, and, and um, we want to also involve uh, pulmonary. Uh, they can get a bronchoscopy. Um, and pulmonary lung function tests um, as, as a workup. 
Um, as uh, indicated before, management is according to grade. Um, grade one and two cases can be managed in the outpatient setting, but grade three and above um, sometimes require uh, hospitalization. Um, and then you should also consider antibiotic therapy for concurrent infection. Um, and then uh, and for those receiving IV serotherapy in the um, hospital. Um, so another uh, side effect that could develop is, um, in G is GI toxicity. Um, incidence of any grade um, diarrhea with immune checkpoint treatment is above 30%. Uh, some of the side, uh, some of the symptoms are diarrhea, abdominal pain, um, perirectal bleeding, uh, cramping um, uh, could be the most common. But other side effects include nausea, vomiting, fever, and um, change in uh, bowel habits. Uh, you can um, you can get radiological signs of colitis, um, or it could be clinical. Uh, you can also um, send for uh, nonspecific markers uh, called CRP or fecal calprotectin, um, and sometimes this can be enough to um, support management, uh, initiation of manage management, sorry. Um, we also recommend early involvement of um, gastroenterology to facilitate um, colonoscopy um, and biopsy if in indicated. And um, management, again, is according to grade. Uh, grade one related um, immune checkpoint inhibitor related uh, uh, diarrhea can be monitored with treatment continuation. Um, cases of grade two uh, may require uh, management with oral steroids um, or other immunosuppressive agents such as um, infliximab. For grade three and above, sometimes may require um, hospitalization and high, uh, high, high dose steroids uh, along with supportive measures. Uh, you should also involve um, multidisciplinary specialists like dietitians, gastroenterologists, and general surgery. Um, so diarrhea, as um, many of you are aware, can lead to severe dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. So supportive care uh, with IV hydration and electrolyte replacement may be needed. Um, some um, it is important to discuss uh, with your patients what to uh, expect with side effects, including um, how long symptoms may last and when to consider going to the um, emergency room. Um, and um, some you can kind of go over also with the patient's tips to uh, manage diarrhea. So some of these uh, tips, some of these uh, management uh, could be uh, drinking clear liquids, um, avoiding milk products, uh, eating low fiber foods, uh, eating small frequent meals, um, choosing foods, um, choosing foods that are not high risk, and avoiding foods that can irritate the GI tract. Um, another potential side effect is um, endocrinopathies. Uh, these can um, persist after completion and cessation of immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Um, but their management differs from other uh, adverse events um, in three ways. Uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy can be usually continued in most cases. Um, high dose corticosteroids are rarely required. Um, and an endocrine deficiency usually persists, necessi necessitating lifelong replacement. Um, the most common immunotherapy related endocrinopathy is thyroid dysfunction, um, hypothyroidism more commonly than hyper. Um, as with all immune checkpoint inhibitor toxicity, um, treatment cessation must be considered in grade three and above, um, uh, to grade three and above toxicity, and any that um, don't respond to uh, other uh, means of treatment. Um, for hypothyroid, we usually start levothyroxine, um, 50 to 100 micrograms, and adjust according to thyroid levels. Um, hypophysitis are um, usually highest in combination therapy, uh, followed by single agent like with just Yervoy or um, anti-PD-1 therapy like um, pembrolizumab. Um, diabetes uh, is another endocrine-related side effect, um, and it usually results in permanent insulin-dependent state and the incidence is usually 1% to 2% across um, ICI regimens. Uh, we generally um, consult endocrine for their guidance in, in these treatments because, um, you know, things like hypophysitis require those adjustment of um, things like hydrocortisone. 
Um, so kind of a more uh, less common side effect, but, uh, but still possibility is uh, cardiovascular toxicity. Um, potential uh, toxicities uh, in associated with ICI therapy includes myocarditis, acute coronary syndrome, arrhythmias, and non-inflammatory heart failure. Um, it's usually rare, about 1 to 2 percent um, of these cardiovascular, cardiovascular toxicities happen with ICI therapy. Um, some risk factors are if you have prior cardiovascular disease, um, if you have chronic disease such as kidney disease or diabetes, and um, concurrent use of cardiotoxic agents. Um, so from some management of cardiovascular toxicities, if you detect it, uh, check serial troponins, uh, ECG, TTE, um, cardiac MRI, um, these can be helpful in um, diagnosis and monitoring response to immunosuppressive therapy. Um, so for severe, and for severe cases, we usually do not restart the immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, uh, another potential side effect of um, ICIs is hepato hepatotoxicity. Um, usually between 1 and 2% of cases are grade 3 uh, um, in for treatments with immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, because we get labs prior to uh, each immunotherapy um, uh, dose that, uh, that those who are treated with ICS get, um, we usually monitor liver functions pretty closely so we can kind of um, you know, know when uh, it's starting to get, uh, you know, the levels are starting to rise. Um, management is, again, according to grade, uh, and systemic um, treatment is needed in grade three and above, and should be and should be considered. Um, and steroids are recommended first line treatment, uh, with the possibility of using um, second line such as um, salsept. Um, so hematologic toxicity is um, you know is usually pretty rare or can uh, occurs less than five percent of patients treated with these agents, and for Presentations can be varied, uh, includes um, cytopenias, like low uh, white blood cells, red blood cells, um, platelets. Um, they could also, you know, they could develop hemolytic anemias and uh, TTP. Uh, usually we refer to hematologists to guide management and, um, and, and they can determine uh, how to manage um, from there. Um, so, um, another potential side effect is neurological and rheumatological toxicities. Um, they can, uh, there are broad categories of, of, um, of these uh, toxicities, and the most common uh, rheumatologic toxicity is um, joint pains um, and myalgias. Uh, usually, um, patients can uh, you know, continue with treatment uh, if they have just you know, minor joint pains, grade one. Uh, but if it gets to be uh, really bad, then um, we usually uh, start uh, steroids. Um, so some neurotoxicities uh, include um, myositis, meningitis, encephalitis, um, and those are, are again, um, are pretty rare. Uh, we, and then we usually refer to um, rheumatology and neurology if needed. Uh, so some key points on um, on immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, they're associated with um, a diverse range of immune-related toxicity that can range from mild to severe and life-threatening. Um, management is both organ-specific and according to grade, uh, with corticosteroids as first-line systemic treatment. Um, early involvement of a specialist is important to determine whether second-line therapy um, is necessary. And then um, being aware of the many immune-related adverse events associated with immune checkpoint inhibitors um, is important to promote early diagnosis and appropriate management um, of these conditions. Uh, so now what we'll discuss um, very briefly is um, those who are high risk for developing squamous cell skin cancers. Um, so as indicated, I think Dr. Park touched on this, is uh, individuals who are at high risk for squamous cell skin cancer include older age, um, males, uh, light skin pigmentation, sun exposure and sunburn history, and history of immunosuppression. Um, for the purpose of this web webinar, though, we will focus on um, those who have a history of immunosuppression. 
So in general, uh, the population in, in the general population, one in five Americans would develop skin, can skin cancer. Um, compared to the general population, transplant recipients are about 65 times more likely to develop squamous cell skin cancer. Um, so the skin cancers in immunosuppressive individuals is um, can be more aggressive. Um, sometimes life uh, left, if uh, especially if left untreated, um, and they have the potential to uh, spread to other parts of the body. Um, so it's important for dermatologists and transplant teams to help identify um, those who are at risk and um, do a surveillance uh, for full body skin cancer screening at appropriate intervals. Um, so another group of uh, another population of immunos in immunosuppression include um, those with uh, blood cancers like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, uh, those patients are five times more likely to develop squamous cell skin cancer. Um, and then the chemotherapy and radiation to treat these conditions um, can put uh, put the patient at risk for um, skin cancer. Um, in addition, um, higher risk of developing skin cancer, those with leukemia and lymphoma can have a higher rate of skin cancer recruitment after treatment with surgery. Um, so some key points, and I know I went through that really quickly, but uh, so, so some key points is ideally transplant patients should undergo a skin assessment before and after organ transplant and um, HCT. However, um, time, resources, and availability of dermatologists can limit this practice. Um, transplant physicians um, should discuss skin-related issues at follow-up visits um, and, uh, and, um, and just uh, let, ask them if uh, they have any um, issues uh, during, during their visits. Um, so that uh, concludes my talk on um, you know, side effects of treatment and those at high risk. And so I'll pass it along to Sam. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so while I get my slides up, I just first want to thank the previous um, speakers for that amazing, great information, as well as the NCCN for providing this opportunity. So I will be brief. I just have a couple of um, slides. Um, but first, let me introduce myself. My name is Sam Guild. I am the president of the Skin Cancer Education and Research Foundation. I think it's important there to tell you a little bit about me first. So um, my sister passed away from melanoma 20 years ago and our family wanted to give back to the skin cancer community. We started by forming the Aim at Melanoma organization and um, more recently the, we um, formed the Skin Cancer Education and Research Foundation. So, um, I just want to share with you a little bit of, about advocacy. You heard great information about medical, but often people who are dealing with a skin cancer want to give back. And so I just want to share with you a couple of ways you can do that. First, what is advocacy? Um, in case you're interested, it is really giving back to others, whether it's raising education about awareness, early detection, helping people get access to treatment options, um, so I'm going to share with you um, ways that you can do that. So how can you get involved? Um, well, there are many ways you can do that. The first one, the more obvious one is getting involved with legislation. One of the things that we started doing very early on is um, trying to protect minors from the dangers of indoor tanning devices. And we've worked on, and you can certainly do this as well. Um, there are some states now, but um, really, it should be all 50 states um, preventing um, those under the age of 18 from being able to use these devices. We know it, it um, increases one's chances of developing a skin cancer. So I encourage you to reach out to legislators, ask them to introduce bills. You could speak um, at hearings, write an op-ed piece, encourage others to get involved. It's certainly an easy way to prevent others from developing um, a skin cancer. Um, sharing your stories, again, whether it's with a legislator, whether it's on the um, Skin Cancer Education Research Foundation website, even just sharing your story with other people around you, friends and family, letting them know that um, skin cancer can be very serious and that they should do whatever they can to prevent it when possible, as well as get it checked out if they see anything suspicious. 
Um, another way is um, you can join patient panels. There's um, really your story is so important to share with providers, pharmaceutical companies, government agencies. Um, they need to know about your experiences, what the unmet needs are, um, where the shortfalls are, and what they can do that make to make things even better. Um, and again, that's something that we can certainly help you get involved with. Um, also, we heard a lot um, about clinical trials. Um, we are where we we are where we are today because of clinical trials. And but there's certainly a lot that needs to get done. And so researchers are certainly doing their best. But it's really important that the patient voice be part of that discussion. Who would know better about what the unmet needs are? How to encourage patients and families to be involved in clinical trials? And so your um, your input is so greatly important. And again, that's something that we can help you get involved with. Um, and of course, I would like to encourage people to share our website. There is information about it. Um, a couple of things that you can find on our website is questions to ask your doctor, side effect management sheets. Um, in a couple of months, we're hoping to have our helpline. Um, we will have somebody available to help answer your general questions um, about skin cancer. And again, knowledge is power. And so, if nothing else, I want to you know thank you for you know getting you know becoming more educated about your disease. I know the NCCN has an amazing patient guideline. I is a great resource. Um, and and any questions, I'll you know we have a Q and A coming up next. But of course, I want to encourage you to speak with your provider if you have any questions after this webinar. I do not believe in stupid questions when it comes to your health. So thank you again um, for having me and for this opportunity. The Q&A will begin shortly. You may now submit your questions to the presenters. Okay, so we already have a couple of questions here. Uh, one for um, just address to Dr. Park about what do you recommend for a young patient that is frequent visits with dermatologists uh, every six months with extensive history of squamous and basal carcinoma, all have surgical excisions with clear margins, but each year new lesions develop elsewhere. Is there a preventative treatment and should patient be referred to medical oncologist for care? Yeah, that's a great question. So I see a lot of patients that can, you know, they always see dermatology and dermatology is always doing a Mohs procedure or some other procedure for these frequent local squamous cell skin cancers that crop up. And um, I think for those patients, there are, are perhaps two things you could consider. One is there's a vitamin called nicotinamide that um, is relatively harm harmless. You can, I think, buy it over the counter. And there is a study that has shown that if you have a normal immune system, so you are not immune compromised, that if you take this vitamin twice a day for a year, you may have less of these squamous cell skin cancers develop. Um, there's also another drug that's a prescription that your dermatologist can discuss with you. Um, it's, it's a type of vitamin A derivative called acetretin, and these are pills that sometimes can really decrease the um, the skin cancers that you get over time, but they have a lot of side effects. And so this is why it requires a discussion with your dermatologist. Um, I've also been asked, you know, can some of these systemic therapies like these IV PD-1 inhibitors, can they help patients get less of the little skin cancers that crop up and their dermatologist always has to hack off? And what we've seen is that, you know, even if a patient has a large skin cancer that really responds well to the PD-1 inhibitor, it doesn't really do anything to these other small ones that crop up. And we think that's because the bi biology of these two squamous cell skin cancers, even though they're both squamous cell, um, there's something different about having like a really advanced lesion, lesion versus having one that's a bit more superficial and local. Thank you. Um, next question is, I've had five squamous cell carcinomas excised most surgery by dermatologists since nine, uh, September of 2020. Two were in the same area of the scalp, but the rest were in various locations. Does frequency suggest high risk squamous cell cancer? Should I see an oncologist and not just a dermatologist? Um, I think you really need to ask your doctor about, you know, 
you know, when they looked at the pathology under their microscope, did they have high risk features? You know, sometimes a dermatologist will take a squamous cell skin cancer off and then they will find that the cancer either has perineural invasion or has poor differentiation. And so it may be considered high risk based on those uh, tables that I showed you. And so if it's a local skin cancer, but it still has high risk features, sometimes that warrants a discussion with both a radiation oncologist and a medical oncologist to consider treatment after the surgery. Um, but that's not necessarily, that's not necessary if the skin cancer is a low risk one. So how does the order work? If you go to a dermatologist and they find something suspicious, then you might go to a, a, a dermatologist that's a specialist in Mohs surgery, correct? How do you know who to follow up with? Yeah, so typically the patient will see a, a, you know, a general dermatologist who finds a suspicious skin lesion, and then that dermatologist will perform a biopsy. If that biopsy comes back as squamous cell skin cancer, that dermatologist will typically refer to a special dermatologist that does Mohs surgery, because not all dermatologists do Mohs surgery. And then that Mohs surgeon can do the surgery. And if that Mohs surgeon finds high risk features, either when they do the procedure or when they, sometimes some Mohs surgeons sends the actual surgery specimen to a skin cancer pathologist to take a look at it. If they find high risk features there, sometimes the Mohs surgeon will either refer the patient to a medical oncologist themselves or will ask the general dermatologist to place the referral. Okay, thank you. So thanks for noting lymphoma and leukemia as increased risk. What is the situation with my multiple myeloma chemotherapy followed by an autologous stem cell transplant? So um, no GVHD. Uh, I can answer this one as well. So multiple myeloma is another blood cancer. Even if you have not gotten a stem cell transplant, a lot of those drugs that are used, um, you know, consist of proteasome inhibitors or, um, you know, it's something called an imid like Revlimid. Um, they do, you know, depress your immune system. So even patients that have multiple myeloma without a transplant or with a transplant, if you have a history of getting a lot of skin cancers, you should follow closely with a dermatologist. Um, and so we had a question about uh, what are some basic preventative measures and um, if you could speak about Seclara and similar face creams that target pre-cancer, if they're considered a preventative. Um, so I don't think I know a lot about uh, Zyclara. Um, so I think, you know, speaking to your dermatologist would be um, good about that. And um, some basic prevention prevention measures, um, you know, it would be uh, sunscreen, um, you know, wearing uh, uh, sun protective clothing, um, wearing hats, um, and just following up with your uh, dermatologist uh, regularly, like every six months to a year. Okay, thank you. Um, so, a, a clarification on niacinamide and nicotinamide, if there's a difference. Uh, they go by the same name, so um, there's really not a difference. Um, here's another one where I had many squamous cell carcinomas because of being immunocompromised due to disease. With the most recent biopsy, I was given imiquimod, but saw online that it's primarily for basal cell carcinoma and then, uh, or warts, is it just as effective with squamous? Uh, yeah, imiquimod is typically more commonly used for basal cell skin cancer. Um, I know that there's some dermatologists that sometimes will consider it for squamous cell skin cancer, especially if it's one that's a lower risk one. Um, and that's something I would recommend that um, you discuss with your dermatologist. I don't really prescribe imiquimod. After having both Mohs surgery and eight and a half hour surgery to remove a seven centimeter squamous cell carcinoma, 
I still get skin lesions. I have best options. So it seems like after having Mo surgery for a large tumor, um, and that this person is still getting skin lesions, they're getting fluorocil, and they have a special shampoo and something else, and they're just trying to figure out what would be the options. So if you've already had skin cancer that's been removed by Mohs surgery and you have other skin cancers, um, that's something that I would recommend that you discuss with your dermatologist, um, depending on the types of other skin cancer lesions you have and where they are. Sometimes they can do cryotherapy if it's like a pre-malignant condition. Sometimes they will just, you know, cut it and burn it off. Sometimes they will have to consider more Mo surgery. They typically use a 5-fluorouracil, also known as Effudex, to most patients by the brand name, to really try to burn off pre-malignant skin lesions before they actually develop into a full-blown squamous cell skin cancer. Um, I'm not too familiar with the shampoos, but um, there are lots of different options, and I would just recommend that you discuss with your dermatologist. How do I know when I should contact my doctor if I'm having side effects? Um, so, uh, I usually say um, to contact the doctor um, when you develop side effects that you're you're not sure of. Um, but in general, um, I say to the patient, um, like four to six bouts of diarrhea in a day, um, not being able to eat or drink, um, and uh, you know anything that you um, find concerning. I, I feel like you should. Um, uh, contact the doctor when you're undergoing uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy because there's lots of side effects that uh, we know of, but also you know side effects that um, could could happen. Um, and uh, if you're you know if 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 you're concerned, then I would definitely contact the doctor. When speaking of squamous cell cancer, does that include squamous cell, anal, vulvar, et cetera? Um, and if you've had an HPV squamous cell skin cancer, are you more susceptible to squamous cell uh, skin cancer and vice versa? So maybe just a clarification on types of squamous cells and squamous cell cancers. Yeah, so there are different types of squamous cell cancers and the squamous cell cancer that's on your skin. So a cutaneous squamous cell cancer or a squamous cell skin cancer is different than the squamous cell skin can or the squamous cell cancers that you get in the lung or in the tongue or in the anal region. Um, sometimes vulvar skin cancer or vulvar or squamous cell cancer, depending on where it occurs, sometimes can be considered more of a skin lesion, but um Typically, what we see with a squamous cell skin cancer in, is in sun exposed areas, most typically in the head and neck. Yeah, HPV is typically associated with head and neck mucosal squamous cell carcinoma. So, you know, squamous cell carcinomas of the, um, you know, the throat or, you know, the back of your tongue. Um, sometimes some patients can have HPV, you know, found on cutane or skin lesions, but it is not something that we look for like we do for squamous cell carcinomas um, that occur like in the mouth, like I mentioned, but um, those are different types of squamous cell cancers. Thank you. So I had a question for Sam. I'm curious, what would you say when people contact your organization, what's the most common question they have or concern? So the most common question is people wanting to know what um, them describing um, their lesion and asking whether we think it's a skin cancer or not. Um, and obviously that's not something we can do because we're not medical providers. But the truth is, is that people know their bodies better than other others, even your doctor. And so our response to people is if you have a lesion or a spot that you find concerning, then you should reach out to your provider and make an appointment. And if you can't get one from your provider, then um, try to find someone else. Um, so one of the other questions we do get is about side effects. And I believe I mentioned the fact that we have side effect uh, management sheets, but again, 
um, we we try to give people some general information and then encourage them to reach out to their provider and have a discussion about their specific care. So those are the two two big questions we get. So I guess the thought would be is it can take a long time to get a dermatology appointment, right? Six months, a year. Is there a way you can kind of expedite that by saying I have a concern or what have you found? So it's difficult for all of us. Um, and yes, you know, um, doctor's appointments are very difficult to get. Um, really, it's important for people to be their own advocate and to share with the schedule, because it's probably who you're talking to about your concern and the importance of getting in. Um, and then if you don't get an appointment right away, um, try another office. Again, I know that's not always easy, um, particularly depending upon the health care plan that you have, um, but maybe it's a question of, um, you know, talk, going back to your general practitioner and just really advocating for yourself. Um, and, you know, I don't want to say and being forceful in a you know, gentle way that it's important for you to get in and hopefully you can get in as quickly as possible. And I do think a lot of doctors offices um, respond to people's concerns. Great, thank you. Um, and so, Christine, what would you say is the most maybe common question or concern that you get? Uh, um, I mean, they're all uh, patients are really concerned about the potential side effects. Um, and we as practitioners, um, you know, uh, can't predict how bad or how severe their side effects can be. So, um, you know, I think what I usually do is just uh, let them know that it can affect any part of the body and um, because the body can't do, uh, you know, can't control the inflammation that it causes. So um, I kind of break it down that way so that they can, they kind of know that, um, uh, that it can affect any part of the body and the symptoms that are associated with it are usually the organ, organ that it affects. Oh. Okay, great. Thanks. So we are out of time for today. Thank you everyone for attending. The NCCN Foundation would like to also thank our corporate supporter of this webinar.